Hi, my name is Michael Goodfriend, and I'm the executive producer of the Play On Podcasts. Okay, there are good voices, great voices, and then there are some voices that might as well belong to the gods. Keith David is one of those voices, someone who could read the phone book and make it sound biblical. He's a three-time Emmy Award-winning actor who's also been nominated for the Tony Award and has played key roles in Oscar-winning films like Crash and Platoon. He's played over 300 roles in every genre imaginable, including an extensive career as a voiceover artist for animated films, TV shows, games, interactive media, and countless commercials. Fortunately for us, Keith David plays the title role in Next Chapter's Play on Podcast series, King Lear, and he's here with me now. Keith, David, welcome to the bonus content series for Play on Podcasts. Well, thank you, Michael. I'm glad to be here. It's great to have you. When did you know you were going to be an actor? I wanted to be an actor my whole life. You know, I mean, I can't really remember not wanting to be an actor. I'm, I'm a singer. And... Um, I started singing first, I think, you know, sort of entertaining the troops and that, you know, my father, my father and grandfather used to have a club, a social club. And uh, two or three times a year, they would throw a dance uh, and a bus ride. It'd be like, there like two dances a year, fall, winter. And then in the summertime, there were like two bus rides. And they were, it was very sort of, uh, entrepreneurial in the sense that it, you know, he was always, you know, um, he had a, he always had a, a a good side hustle, you know, with uh, like with like with like like I said with my grandfather, and they had the, they had a club, and you know during the year they threw dances and they threw bus rides, always some something to bring a little money in on the side. Where was the club? Or was it a floating club? Like, it, was a, it, was a, it was a floating club. I forget the name of their club. Uh, but like I said, you know, they would throw dances, you know, in Harlem at the like at the Audubon. And there was an and, and the Rennie. Uh, uh, and then uh, in the summertime, we'd go to Lake Sebago or uh, Mount Holyoke um, Amusement Park. You know, uh, Seba- Lake Sebago was a beach. And I think they had a. At one of them, and I think Holyoke was a uh, like an amusement park, and at Lake Sebago they also had a, a skating rink. So very early in my life, I used to watch my grandmother and my grandfather skating together. I mean, and that to me that was the most thrilling thing in the world to see. I mean, the way that they would, you know, that to me they were like Dorothy Hamill and whoever else. On, on 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 roller skates because they would they would skate together and they looked like such such a loving couple that what that was to me that's what love looked like were you one of many siblings how many people i had i have uh, i have three siblings uh i have two siblings i have two brothers uh and but my first cousin who uh our our, our mothers were pregnant together so i'm born on june the 4th my first cousin is born October 4th. So we're exactly four months apart. And we grew up like brothers for the first two years of our lives. It was just him and me. Uh, I had, we had an older cousin, uh, Kathy. Um, and, but she was, she, she was significantly enough older that she would watch us, you know, so, you know, um, so it was basically us, and then two years later, my brother came along, and then it was the three of us, um, my, my middle brother, before my youngest brother came along, which was 10 years later. Uh, so, we, you know, we had, we had a close-knit kind of little thing going uh, among cousins. And you grew up in New York City, in and around the city? In the city. I mean, I, I, grew, I was born in Harlem. Grew up in the Bronx and, you know, we, we at first my parents lived in the Bronx for a little bit, but I grew up mostly in Queens, but I was in Harlem every weekend. Uh, my first acting school was the Harlem School of the Arts. The Fame High School. Uh, you know, fa- yeah, the Fame High School Performing Arts was downtown on 46th Street. When you went into uh, the School of the Arts, were you going in to be an actor or to be a singer? Well, it's funny you say that because 
I went in, I went in as an actor because I, I in junior high school, I did a play. I mean, I, I, again, like I said, I was always a singer, but I had done a play. I had in, uh, in, in the fifth grade, I did The Wizard of Oz and um, um, Mrs. Zimmerman and Mrs. Garodna. Mrs. Garodna's husband wrote Tubby the Tuba. I don't know if you remember a cartoon called Tubby the Tuba, but he was one of the, he was, I don't know what he did was he was, wasn't one of the composers, whether he was the cartoonist, but I know he had something to do with that. I, and I just remember that from those days. And they were the ones who encouraged me to audition for the high school of performing arts. And I did, and I got in, I was 13 years old. That was after, after being in the wizard of Oz. I was after being in the Wizard of Oz. In fact, it was because of being in the Wizard of Oz. And then from there, did you, you graduated from high school, you started working professionally right away, or did you go to... Um, I went to, uh, after, after performing arts, I went to SUNY at Purchase for a year. I was asked to leave SUNY at Purchase <laughs> after a year. <laughs> and, and, and they, they, they and, didn't like your voice? Well, um, you know, listen, I was 17 years old. I, it, I was into everything with a coffin. It was, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it was a wild time. And um, although I, I, I was serious about wanting to be an actor, you know, I, I, I don't know if I was so serious about going to school. So, I, you know, some, somewhere there was that sort of disconnect or something. So, I left and and uh, and uh, one of my one of my one of my teachers who had sort of a I, when I look back on it now, it was it was she was she was uh, whether whether or not it was. Um, she wasn't the kind of racist who was just I don't like you. But there was it was a, there was a there was a racist bent in her aspect because, you know. Uh, when she told when when I was being asked to leave, she said, "You know, you should go study with an all black troop somewhere. Don't even think about Juilliard. That's that's not for you." And the truth, tell you the truth, Juilliard hadn't been on my radar. I had I had I had I don't even know if I even heard of Juilliard. Uh, but I was like, I, I don't know what that's about. And, and again, I didn't even pay it any mind. It happened that. Uh, when I left there, I did go study with an all black troupe. I went, I went and studied with the Negro Ensemble Company. And it happened that my teacher, uh, I, you know, I met Doug Turner Ward for the first time, but I wasn't in his class. I was in Moody's class. And James Moody had been a graduate of, of performing arts and he was a graduate of Juilliard. We were exactly sort of like four years apart. So um, as I was graduating from performing arts high school, he was graduating from Juilliard. Um, so again, like I said, that, that first, that, that's that first year, 1974, I went into purchase, uh, and then left purchase. And that's, uh, you know, we got out in the summer and somewhere, August. Oh yes, that's what I did. I did. I uh, one of my one of my teachers at uh, at performing arts. His name was Judd Jones. He was the first black man that, that had ever taught me acting, and he was fast. It was I was fascinated with him. He was he, what an instrument he had, and uh, and he was a man who avidly loved the theater. He just saw everything. And he was friends with all these people, Martin Sheen and uh, uh, Diane Carroll. And, I mean, he, it, I mean, without, without uh, he, he didn't name drop. He just spoke of the benefit of his experience. He did movies with Cassavetes. Um, and so, and his, his love of the theater, it was just remarkable. He did, he did, he took over for um, 
David Carradine, I think, uh, 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 in the Royal Hunt of the Sun, when it was on Broadway. So he was a he was a friend of uh, Christopher Plummer, and it 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 got me fascinated in that play. So anyway, before we graduated from high school, we had uh, he. Um, he, he let us see a dress rehearsal of his one man show. And ever since then, I was just fascinated with doing a club act, night one man show kind of thing. So right before I got into Juilliard, while I was still studying at the Negro Ensemble Company, I decided to do a one man show. And uh, one of my, you know, one of my best friends, uh, Jose Rosario, who was in that class with me, I decided to do a one man show and, and uh, I, <laughs> I think I sang every song I ever wanted to sing, and I did scenes from plays. You know, it was it, it was wonderful. We did a we did a scene from Beckett, and uh, and that summer, nineteen seventy five, I also auditioned for Julia. I was a, I was a late auditioner, I auditioned in May, and I got in. So, so uh, you must have been in, and you must have been in one of the early groups of of Juilliard. What, I was in group eight. That was early enough, you know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> because now they have group 50 or whatever, you know, I mean, it's like right. crazy, but I was in group eight. Was there, is there a link between your father's floating club that I keep thinking of like, like guys and dolls, the floating craps game, there's a, <laughs> a link, a link from that to your, your recognition uh, of being what the way you described it, a club performer doing a one man show. Uh, not really, because they, I mean, when I say they had a, they had a club, a social club, you know, they would, I, you know, as I, as I remember it, I, 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 in this conversation is going to prompt me to go ask him how that was run. Uh, they would have meetings. They had dues. There were members, and, and I know that they were charged with going to sell tickets. And, um, uh, and they, they would go and sell tickets to these dances. It would be, it was massive. So it was a it was a formal club. It was an actual social club. Yeah, yeah. They didn't have it. They they didn't they didn't have a building. I don't. They didn't have. They had no building of their own. They they just you know they would meet in somebody's house or 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 wherever. I don't remember where they met, but uh, but they would with their dues, they would rent out the Rennie, the Renaissance, or the Club Audubon. They would rent it out for a Saturday night. And then they would charge tickets for their dance. I, I don't believe it was a live music dance. I believe it was a sort of a DJ situation. But again, I'd have to ask him. I don't remember that because I was too young to ever attend one of those dances. Uh, but I know they had them. I did go on the bus rides. Do you remember your first professional job? What was it as an, as an actor? What was your first professional job? What was my first professional job? Ah. My first professional job, I was still in high school. Uh, my manager, Josh Silver, who, who I went to high school with, he and I, and, and a guy named Greg, Greg Costello, I think his name was, we were cast in a play at the Clark Center, which is now the Eurus Theater. The Clark was, there was, was part of the YMCA over there on 50th um we it was it, the play was called will the real superman please stand up i was 16 years old and that was my first professional play the the uh the director and playwright was a man named bernie k bernard k k um and it was the musical uh i played god my character was called god um and that's why you have the voice of a god. <laughs> I, you know, I am God, uh, but it, you know. And then, and I remember there was a uh, uh, there was a character. I don't remember the guy's name, but um, he wrote a song called "Find the Light." I think it was called. I'll never forget that because because the guy reminded he had a sort of um, Johnny Mathis kind of sound find the light find the light it is there if you care burning for you yearning for you show the light anyway something like that uh 
And I, and I was, I mean, it was that song. I had my song. I am God. Uh, there was another song. It was a, it was a blue song that, that I really loved. It was sung. I, I, I don't know whatever happened to these people. Um, uh, yeah, that was called after the blues. And I love the way that woman sang that song, man. It was, it was really, it was really, it was great. Um, I hadn't thought about that in years, man. But that was, that was you know, that was that was fifty years ago. My God! Mm. Yeah. And you've had the same manager your whole career, Josh Silver. Yeah, and uh, and he, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, we've been together about you know, a little, about twenty five. Well, uh, about twenty five years, I guess we've been together at least. Uh, maybe almost closer to thirty years because he, you know, I think I think we got together he became my manager in 92 something like that 1992 around that time did you did you find him again did he find you well you know uh, josh and i were always kind of close we both lived in queens going to high school together i i had been in performing arts i came in in 69 he came in in 70 so he was a sophomore when he came in and we did we did his fir- his fir- his very first acting scene the fir- it was me and him did together it was a it was from a play called Wednesday's Child and uh i remember the year before i had done that <laughs> i had done i had done Wednesday's Child with a guy who was who, uh, named Mark i don't remember Mark's last name but I played the other part. There's a, it's a, it's a sort of about, about uh, these two kids. They, they, they were like, um, they like the Bowery boys, you know, you know, bad boys in a reform school. And uh, I, I, all I remember is the first line is, hey kid, you crying? <laughs> uh, and I played the kid with Mark and Josh played the kid with me, you know, so. Um, uh, it was, I mean, it was fun and, and, you know, and for a while, um, you know, when when we left, um, when, you know, Josh and I went through high school together and then we went to purchase together and then we got kicked out of purchase together. Uh, he went on to the circus and he was a clown for the next three to five years. And he always wanted me to come in to be a singing ringmaster. It never worked out. I always got an acting job and couldn't do it. Um, but we stayed friends and we would see each other periodically. It wasn't like we saw each other every weekend or anything, or, you know, sometimes it would be a couple of years in between, but we stayed in contact. And, uh, finally, um, yeah, I, it, I was, I was out of school about 10 years or more. Cause yeah, I graduated in 79 and, uh, he became my manager. 89, between 89 and 91, something like that. So fill in the blank, the the gaps there between graduating from Juilliard now, right? And and when did you feel like you had kind of settled into a career that you didn't need to have a side hustle along with? Or have you always had to have a side hustle with your career? Well, you know, I mean, I didn't have the temperament to wait tables. Uh, I just didn't. So I started, I studied massage. I first, I went to the Ohashiatsu school to study shiatsu so I could do massage. And, you know, I I, I did that only for one show uh, because I found out very soon that if you put a shingle up, then you got to work on anybody who's got, I mean, at the time I was only charging 30 bucks an hour. Uh, but if you put a shingle up, anybody who's got 30 bucks, you got to work on them. And I didn't, I didn't want to work on everybody because I didn't like everybody. I didn't want to, you know, exchange that energy with everybody. Um, but like I said, I didn't do that. I didn't do that terribly long. I still have the ability to do massage and I do it when I want to, but I don't, I don't, uh, solicit like that. And then, uh, in 81, I took my speech teacher training with Edith Skinner. So, uh, I do teach a course called Good American Speech for the Theater. Um, and I, and uh, in, what, what year was that? Um, 
God. It was somewhere like 83 or something like that. I quit acting because I couldn't stand myself, you know, uh, and I, and I, and that, that was very real for me. I really, I, 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 I hated myself for being in judgment of how badly I thought other people might be acting. Um, and, and if you're, you're so busy judging everybody else, what are you doing? And I, so I found myself becoming somebody I didn't like. So I, I decided to leave the theater. I'm gonna quit the theater. I don't ever want, I don't want to be around the theater anymore. I didn't want to act. So uh, uh, one of the ladies who I studied speech with, uh, Elizabeth Himmelstein, I became her assistant when she was teaching at Purchase. So 10 years after getting kicked out of Purchase, I went back to Purchase to teach speech. Uh, and I was her assistant. So that was, you know, that was, uh, that was my sweet revenge, you know. And then how did acting find you again? Or how did you find your way back? Um, that, 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 like I said, that was around 83, something like that was around 1983. Grotowski was doing, a, was doing a three-year program at Irvine. And I... I who, is, who is Grotowski? Jerzy Grotowski. Uh, Tell us. Uh, uh, and he had, uh, what was it, the theater? It wasn't the living theater, but it, the, the, the Towards the Poor Theater he wrote. Right. And uh, it was, it was, it was, it was very much, or, you know, about physical theater, you know, you know, being able to physically and, you know, do in, interpret the work so that you, you could watch the, you, 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 you know, the body was involved. And, you know, you could, you could, uh, you could tell the story, even if you didn't understand the language. And I remember we had, it was a couple of us who had gone, he was, he was doing uh a production in Philly and a couple of us uh, uh, went from purchase to Philly to see that show. And I remember, i never forget how magnificently moved I was seeing this, seeing it was a Polish group do this, do, do theater. And I didn't understand a word not even sure I understood what the play was about, but I was, there was so many moving images and, and you know, the way, the way they used their bodies, the way they used their voices and, and the sounds that came out of me, it was just, it was fascinating. I mean, it, it wasn't the first time, but it was one of the clearest and best times that I got to discover that, um, as an actor, you use your whole instrument. It's not just about getting up there and saying the lines, about how your body gets involved with it. I mean, it was just, it was just fascinating. I mean, like I said, I, you know, it, it, it made us uh, uh, have a lasting impression on me. So that experience brought you back into it. You started working again. So that, so, you know, work? Um, so what happened was, uh, um, like I said, I, I was, uh, you know, uh, that's another story, but uh, I uh, had quit the theater, I'd gone to teach, and then an opportunity, I, you know, I, I, cont I you know, uh, uh, I auditioned and um, then I had the choice. Uh, it was either go to Grotowski for three years or play Macheath in the Three Penny Opera. And I couldn't resist. I, you know, I mean, you know, and it was really, it was really a struggle because I, I wasn't afraid to go away. And there were, there were uh, those of my friends and people saying, oh, if you go away, no one's going to remember when you come back, it's going to be, you know, I, was, I wasn't afraid of that. Um, I, it, it, it just, it just happened that the best choice for me at the time was to go play Mac Heath in the Three Penny Opera. And again, that was an experience that I'll never forget. And that was, was life-changing, was wonderful. Where was that? That was at the Alliance Theater in, in, uh, in uh, Atlanta. When did you start doing voiceovers? Um, I had always wanted to do voiceovers in my first agent. Uh, Ted was my first voiceover agent. He was with Jeff Hunter. And uh, uh, he started sending me out. 
And after a while, I, you know, would, would, would even get requested. Uh, and I started doing commercials lightly, you know, slowly. It was, it was the white boys club when I came in. There weren't a whole lot of, there was a, a handful of black men who were doing voiceovers. And then it, it wasn't until right around the time that I started, that I got with Josh as the manager in the, in the late 80s, 89, 89, eight, between 88, 80, 88, it was, it was a summer, I think, or winter, winter, fall of 88. Uh, and I met Paul Hecht and Paul uh, encouraged me to come over to his agency. And Paul was very, very big voiceover guy. And I went over to his agent and um, so do the rest, I mean, you know, the rest is history. I mean, I, you know, once I, once I got with them, I started doing lots and lots of voiceovers and soon went into narration, which was, a, which was been very wonderful for me, but it's, but it's, you know, it's an area that I always wanted to be. And I, I used to love like wild kingdom, those things and uh, the voices of um, um, William Conrad, William John Forsyth, Percy Rodriguez. I mean, my God, I loved his voice. My God, oh my God, what a voice! He was the High Commander, mm. and it's in Star Trek, and just a magnificent voice. Him and, and uh, um, um, William. William Marshall, I mean, uh, these were voices, man. And uh, but you know, like like Bill Conrad uh, was um, Matt Dillon on the radio. I have print two hundred copies. How soon can I send Chester over for him? This afternoon. Good morning, Mister Hightower. Chester. But he did a lot of narrating and stuff, and 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 I and, and I just I you know uh, um, in nine in the in ninety three ninety four something like that when I began doing gargoyles, um, John Forsyth came in to be a guest star one day, and I told him I said, "Man, I oh I've been watching him since Bachelor Father." I don't know if you remember if you're old enough to remember that. Um, and he was always a favorite actor of mine. And and again, a magnificent voice. And he used to do one of those, um, one of those like animal shows. Um, wild, not wild, not wild kingdom, but one of those kind of things like that. And and I it just I, I, I just loved to listen to, you know, those for the most part, they were they were voices who made you want to learn more about whatever they were talking about. And I loved that. And uh, I always wanted to do that. And so now I get to do that. Do you find working on it that that there's a technique to making that happen? I mean, that what is the way that you bring a, a listener in to the words that you are saying? Um, Norman Rose was one of my teachers and it was a great man. He, and he had a magnificent voice. And he always talked about finding the voice of the author. And um, so I, you know, you always try to embrace that. What, you know, it's not about me and, and how wonderful I can sound or anything like that. You know, because when we were growing up, that was the sound of, the, that, was the, that was the sound of the announcer. And they all, it didn't matter what they were narrating. If they were talking about, uh, do you want to buy toilet tissue? It always sounded like that, you know, it, it had that sound. And it wasn't until, it wasn't until uh, the early 80s when suddenly uh, it was like, uh, uh, what was his name? Um, uh, Mason Adams and uh, um, Burgess Meredith. Oh my God. I mean, uh, and so suddenly, you know, people want to women weak in legs, you know. <laughs> so they had so they had, uh, you know, you know, suddenly, you know, uh, commercial copy was like they want a voice like Burgess Meredith or they want or they want. Um, um, 
They want to sound like we shall drink no wine before it's time. You know, um, they want this kind of sound and they wanted more storytelling. So they really wanted actors. And suddenly, uh, you know, when I first graduated, you know, commercial actors doing commercials, that was, that was a, you know, that was not the thing to do. You know, we were serious actors. We weren't going to do, com I wasn't going to do commercial. Well, you learn later at the commercials with a lifeblood, because if you, if you weren't, acting in the theater or you weren't doing a movie and you weren't working and commercials was the, was the thing that tied you over uh and and there were wonderful things it was it was a great thing to do you know you'd be lucky if you could get a commercial when did you get introduced to shakespeare as a performer um my last year of high school i did a scene with katie ryan and we did i played petruchio and uh the Taming of the Shrew, and that was my introduction to Shakespeare. Um, and Bill Britton was the director, so it was very physical. And Katie threw me around, and I was, you know, she, we were doing all this. Um, she was, she was always flipping me and flipping, me, you know, and I was all doing all this falling, and you know. Um, but I, I, I fell in love with the language. Oh my God. Kate, Bonnie Kate, and Kate of all Kates. My, you know, I mean, I was, I was like, wow, love this stuff. Where else outside of Shakespeare could you get to, you know, say things like that until August Wilson came along? Oh my God. And then that was, that was another thing. That was another world opened up, you know, because his use of language, oof, you know, it was it it was Shakespearean and scope, you know. I mean, you know who, you know. Uh, David Mamet also uses like you know, uh, uh, is a master of using language like that, too, you know. But uh, not a whole lot of playwrights do you know work it like that. What you know, what August play? What August Wilson plays have you gotten to do? I have now done. A, you know, my first one was Seven Guitars. And then I've and I've done uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and uh, Joe Turner's Come and Gone. You worked with Joe Papp. I did. Can you tell us about that? My first job out of school, um, I had just you know yeah I graduated in May, but in December, in November, December, um, we opened Othello at school. And then we got to we got to tour it a bit. We re, we we got to replace the acting company at the Bermuda Festival. So we got to play, we got to play the Bermuda Festival, and then we got to play. Um, we got to do it in Florida, in uh, Palm Beach, Florida. Um, and um, they were doing it in the park that summer. Raúl Julia was playing Othello. So. Um, it was, it was, it was in a magnificent experience because I went to audition for Joe. It was just, and I believe it was just Joe in the room. So, um, I did my audition and he said, I finished. He goes, congratulations. The job is yours. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. as a matter of fact, because I was, <laughs> this is a great story. I was auditioning. I think I got to audition with, I was reading with, um, I think I read with Franny Conroy, who was playing Desdemona. And um, um, I had a little time in, bet in between. So across the street from the public theater in those days was a restaurant called The Colonnades. The Colonnades had a little outdoor garden thing. So I'm sitting out there <laughs> and I and I'm sitting by myself and I hear these two people, these two gentlemen are sitting at the table next to me speaking French. So at the time, you know, I, I fancy that, I, my, that my French was pretty good. I, I didn't have an extensive vocabulary, but I did have a pretty decent accent. So I... <laughs> I heard them talking and I, you know, so I'm, I'm like, excuse me, quelle heure est -il? And he answered me and I said, ah, and, uh, and so we introduced it. So um, 
And then, I, then, then they started going off and said, that's about as much as I know. Um, and then we introduced each other and he said, uh, um, uh, I said, oh, I'm, I, my name is Keith. I'm, uh, and he said, my name is Andre. And I said, what, what, do you, what do you do? He says, I'm the director. I said, oh, he, I said, are you working? <laughs> he said, yes, I am working. I'm working across the street. I said, oh, what are you doing? He was, he was, re he was rehearsing a play, and I think he was doing it with Irene Wirth. Um, but it was Andre Serban. And <laughs> but because uh, and then, you know because I told him I was understudying Raul and it, it was just it was just so funny. Uh, <laughs> so, what was the journey like for you doing King Lear, coming into this project, and and having all of this incredible experience behind you as a professional and doing all the voiceover work? coming in and and doing this role oh uh, it was i mean i had a i had a wonderful time i I've, i haven't heard it yet i hope i hope it uh, translates as good as i felt about it um king lear happens to be a play that i did 40 years ago more more more, more than um um when you when you uh, when you get into Juilliard, they they have uh, the I, I don't forget what they call it the test project or the te you know but anyway you're thrown into the deep end of the pool. The very first thing we do is work on a Shakespeare play, and uh, my first play was King Lear, and I got to play King Lear in the. Um, I don't remember now. I think I, I played him in the fifth act, in the first part of the fifth act or something like that. And uh, so it was, and so I was always fascinated with the part, you know, and there were five leaders, you know, I just got to play one of them. But, I, you know, but I, I remember, you know, uh, Bob Yako played one of them, uh, Jim, Jim Owen played. Jim Owen played the first one, and I'll just never forget how he would come in. Hear me, recreant, you know. Uh, and I just loved that language, and and uh, and I've always wanted a chance to do it. And I remember seeing uh, seeing the uh, James Earl do it. James uh, Earl James Earl Jones. James Earl Jones, and you know, you know, from the, you know, I, I didn't see it in the park, but I saw a recording of it. Mm -hmm. And I've uh, always been fascinated with it and wanted to do it. Um, and wanted to do it before I got too old to do it. So um, so this was a wonderful, wonderful sort of opportunity to to get back into it and test the water. I, I, I auditioned for it once with um, Robert Woodruff, I think. Uh, and uh, later on, and I had a wonderful time. I mean, I, I've never spent so much time in an audition. I mean, we work, he worked me and we worked stuff and, you know, and I, and I thought it was really interested in having. Then to come to find out he hired Earl Hyman. Uh, and I'm like, oh, well, I mean, come on. I mean, who would, who would take me if you could get Earl? You know, uh, but... I found out later that he would have offered me Kent, but he didn't think it was a big enough role for me to take. And I'm like, me to play Kent with, with, with Earl? Are you kidding? I it's a huge jumped, role. <laughs> I would have jumped at it, but uh, you know, that's the that's the that's the other thing that happens in this business when people think that you know that uh, the role is not big enough. You wouldn't, you know. I mean, of course, you know, we're at. I mean. We're actors, you know. Listen, there are small parts, but only small actors don't make something of those parts. Uh, anyway, that's just that, awesome. that's a good a good way of putting it. Well, I mean, because because there really are small parts. There really yeah. are small mm -hmm. parts, but you know, you can you can work them. You can, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it's not it's not always about you know. It's not a play about you, but you. But if when you know when you're a good team player and you know what you're you know what your part is. You know how you fit into that jigsaw. And it's an essential part because the jigsaw is not complete without that part. I mean, that's, that's a wonderful way to contribute. 
were you familiar with Marcus Gardley's work prior to this? No, I was not. But I, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to be more familiar with him. Yeah. How did it feel to you working with his? I guess you could call it spin translation. I, I mean, of- I loved it. I mean, having having worked on Pericles and and um, and listened to some of the other podcasts and seeing, you know, um, how you know these these modern playwright poets you know, deal with the language and, and um, uh, you can't really even say contemporizing, just making them more accessible to a contemporary ear. Um, it's some wonderful choices made. Just, you know, I mean, it's not a whole, it's not, I, I didn't find any great drastic, I mean, there, there are some uh, some changes in the language that are, more um, radical than others, but none of them that violated my sensibility. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I just I felt that they were wonderfully able to keep the integrity of the of the of the language and and keep it. It was it 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 certainly didn't become un Shakespearean all of a sudden. It was just you know a little tweaking. I mean. I think I think very much in keeping with Shakespeare himself would have done uh, if he were living now, and how he would you know try to keep it so that you know the average Joe could uh, sit and be amused and and uh, and be in, in, in engrossed and enthralled by this stuff. Was it a, a hard process for you? Was it a rewarding process? How did it feel in comparison to, you know, the process that you normally go through preparing to play a a, a role on stage or on film? Um, you know, it's apples and oranges. I mean, you know, I mean, um, we have we have the prep time that we do and the rehearsal time that we have, and then you got and then you're thrown into the water. But it's like it's like it's like when you're doing a reading of a play. I mean, you know, you don't, you know, I mean with few exceptions, unless it's reader's theater kind of thing, you don't, in, in a reading, you get a couple of rehearsals and then you do it. Now, in, 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 in the best of those experiences, you get, you know, good actors and, a, you know, good leader uh, and, a, and a director who has given you all the great uh, signposts and, uh, um, and you do the best you can. I mean, it's not, it's not like we go into a great in-depth rehearsal. Um, but it, it is what it is, but it, but it's, but it's wonderful because, you know, I mean, it, it's kind of quick, fast in a hurry, but then, but we, so it's a little bit better than that. So we get a chance to break it down a little bit and, and, and analyze and talk and critique and talk, and then we get to do it. And then, and then while we're in the process of recording it, we get to do it again. So if you miss the mark that time, you, you get closer to what you would have done. And so, you know, my experience is that um, if we were if we were actually doing the play, it would just deepen from here. But we would at least hope to get to where we ended up here in the podcast. You know, that that's that's a kind of a wonderful thing. It's not you know, it's not amateur night in Dixie. It's not it's not, you know, just, you know, uh, you know, just coming together and reading the play and it would with, with not knowing anything i mean we come you come to the table with some preparation which is nice what do you have any uh favorite roles that you've worked on i know this is a one of those questions that every actor gets thrown but is there one in particular that that you feel just defined you as an artist in any particular way i love the experience of playing othello um i i i there was there's something about it that I identified with very much. Um, several aspects of the of the character, you know, being a stranger in a strange land, um, loving so deeply that you get blind, um, being able to uh, you know navigate through. Um, uh, cultural differences, you know, lots of, you know, lots of great points of 
uh, identification. And I love the and, the and the language. Oh my God. I mean, it's just such beautiful language. But in the same way, I loved playing Leontes. You know, it, you know, it's sort of a flip side of the same coin. My, I look forward to playing Prospero. My, you know, ideally, one of these days, I mean, it may just be in a sort of a reading situation, but I'd love to play. I, I've, I've played Oberon four times. I would love to play Oberon one night and Prospero the next night. To do those those roles in rep, just to get the, just to get those roles in rep, because they're sort of flip side of the same. They, 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 this is a different aspect, a different a different uh, perspective on magic, and um, one one from a sort of a you know intellectual side, learned side, and the other from the visceral, you know, emotional side. Is it the stage for you ultimately? If you were to, if I could make as much money on stage as you know, as in the movies and TV, I would be on stage most of the time. I, you know, I would choose. You know, it's more work, um, and it's different work. I mean, there's a great line, and I think the little foxes about um, it was a stage door. I see, maybe a stage door. Um, she said, "Oh, acting in the movies is piece work," you know, um, and it can be. Uh, but the, the, it's just something about being in the theater and that energy that you have to, that kind of concentrated energy, even if, you, if you're not in every scene, but sometimes when you are, or you are in most of them, the energy that you have to sustain, there's, some, there's nothing like that. Being in the same room, with this, with the with the audience breathing the same air, you're here right now. This performance is this performance, and uh, tomorrow night is going to be different. Something is going to be different. It's not going to be exactly the same. Although you know, there's there, there's, a, there's a there's a wonderful consistency. There's nothing like that. Having gone through this process with King Lear. How do you feel about this character? You know, I have two daughters. <laughs> and so um, it really did interest me about, you know, how. And, I, you know, again, now, now I really would have, I'd love to spend four weeks exploring these relationships and, uh, and putting them on stage because. You know, love is a love is a very many splendid thing, and, and and its manifestations and its misunderstandings, and the 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 way people behave and react to misunderstandings. the way the ego gets involved in a misunderstanding and how it lashes out. I think it's a, it's a wonderful lesson in um, be careful about what you say to, and how to whom you say it to and how you say it, especially to your children. It has, it has big weight. Be careful how you talk to your parents it has big weight. It caused these girls to commit suicide, to take their own lives. Because somewhere in their consciousness, they knew how wrong they were for treating their father like that, no matter how he treated them. He's at the end of his life. He's old and, and, and uh, is on the brink of senility and, 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 and dementia. But because he has a, 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 a semblance, a, a seeming side of coherence, and you, know, you, and you feel embarrassed in front of the kingdom, in front of the society, that you're gonna, you're gonna okay, you can treat me like that, I'm gonna treat you like that. I mean, I, my, my feeling is, if nothing else, you have to respect the office. They're your parents. He's your father. You don't do that. 
You don't have to, you don't have to like him. You just have to love him. And if that means you have to love him from across the street, you don't disrespect him. And that, that kind of dis, blatant disrespect is biblical. I mean, God will get you for that. You know, I mean, and, uh, and I think that that's what they, they finally wind up experiencing. You know, it, it's a, a kind of backlash of, of, uh, of, of conscious Conscious, you know, you know, you, you know how you're, you know, you know, wh where is your moral compass? And can you, can you, re I mean, you, you think you can live with yourself doing all that dirt, and and, uh, but can you? I mean, if it, it's it's an it it's a great lesson in when I get even, I get even worse. How does he grow by the end of the play? What what is the journey for him? I think one of the things I think is when you make unrealistic demands on your children, and you make them, uh, you, you you sort of use them as puppets to manipulate them to your own end. It too it also has a consequence. You got to let them be adults. You got to let them grow up. And 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 no does not mean I don't love you. Mm hmm. You know, I mean, ultimately, that's what he finds out. And just because somebody is kissing you behind to get along with you doesn't mean that they love you either. So he he really discovers what love really is. I think that's one of the things he discovers the most. What what does love and loyalty really look like? Not just the semblance of it. Not just the 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 outward show of it, but what does it really look like? when it comes down to it. What do we get to see you in next? I was just I was just nominated for uh, an NAACP award for a movie I did called Black as Night. When that's out right now. I guess my first time I got to play Dracula. <laughs> and what are we hearing you in? So what you 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 do tons of commercials. What are some of the uh uh Voices. Right now, right, right now, I have a, um, I have an Airbnb commercial running right now. Well, hopefully, we will hear more of you on future play on podcast series, not just King Lear, not just Pericles, but more to come. Uh, and, uh, I to <laughs> Keith, David, I want to thank you for giving us your time today and for taking us on the journey of your career and also your journey through this role. It's been a real honor and a privilege. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. You've been listening to the Play On Podcast bonus content series. You can learn more about the Play On Podcasts at Next Chapter Podcasts website, ncpodcasts.com. That's N as in next, C as in chapter, podcasts with an S at the end, dot com, where you can find other Play On Podcast series and interviews, along with talk podcasts like the 500, the 10, the Tough Juice Podcast with Karan Butler, and a whole lot more. I'd like to thank Jeremiah Tittle, the founder of Next Chapter Podcasts, and my producer, Peter Musto. Our audio engineer is Adam Bernard, and our editor and sound designer is Justin Cortez. Be sure to subscribe to Next Chapter Podcasts for updates on all the latest content, and don't forget to rate and review our shows. I'm Michael Goodfriend, and I look forward to sharing more incredible works and scripted fiction with you, along with lots of enlightening bonus content at Next Chapter Podcasts. <laughs>